So we're continuing our series talking about the months of the Jewish year in terms of what I'm broadly calling Kabbalistic and Hasidic astrology. Is there such a word and is there such a term? That's, of course, um, something for you to decide. Um, I think there is. I think there is something that we know and understand as astrology and stuff to do with the constellations up in the sky that informs a lot of what we know as Judaism and Jewish practice and Jewish history. And that's what we're going to really start at. We've got to go over the basic cardinal principles, which are things that we start every time with. Every meeting begins with the statement of uh, principles and whatever. Uh, the stars are just stars. Right? You need to understand this and have this very, very clearly. I don't know how they thought of these things in antiquity. We're not particularly interested in where this all came from. The Sumerians are the first ones who noticed constellations about 3,000 years ago, which is the time of Abraham. And that fits very, very nicely with, uh, with our sort of classical Bible-based timeline. Um, but the stars have nothing to do with each other. And if you see the constellation Leo in the sky, um, the stars that make up that picture that we see as sort of looking like a lion, they have nothing to do with each other. They're millions and millions and millions of miles away from each other. Um, it's an image, it's a way of looking at something, it's a way of understanding something. Uh, this astrology is not prescriptive. It will not tell you who to marry, it will not tell you what business to go into. Uh, it may tell you certain things to avoid. It may help you understand stuff but you're not gonna get the reading that you would get from a contemporary astrologer that you would go and plonk down a few dollars and say, what does my future hold, right? Um, and we are referring only to the Hebrew months. The, the stars, the constellations line up with the 12 months of the Hebrew lunar calendar only. Okay, so what did we talk about last time? Um, since this is not a credit uh, course and you're not doing a degree and all of this sort of stuff, I'm going to do the summary. Okay, I don't expect you to have this, have it all clear in your mind. But what we did look at was some text from a book called the Shem Mishmuel, right? Which is a very popular work of the very well-known Hasidic rabbi, Rabbi Shmuel Bornstein, 1855 to 1926. So relatively recent in, in, terms of, in terms of all this sort of stuff. And the advantage of Rabbi Shmuel and his, his book is that it's relatively easy to read. It's one of the easier reads uh, across the whole spectrum of Hasidic rabbis wrote, writing on stuff. Um, other side of the coin is there is there's a great deal of information that you need to know before you can get into it and understand what he's what he's talking about. What I think we have seen from the piece of text that we learned, and the text that we learned specifically was a talk that he gave on Rosh Chodesh, Mar Cheshvan, the first day of the month of Cheshvan in the year 5672, which was October 23rd, 1911. I, I kind of like these sort of details. You're welcome to um, not write them down and not remember them, but 1911. Um, so he, he, lives through, he lives through the First World War. And talking about a lot of different things, but largely about the history and the stories of the Bible and how what we know as Kabbalistic astrology is part of the foundation of those stories. Let's put that in real simple English. Uh, there are stories in the Bible which we as believing Jews and otherwise um, hold to be true. Um, the, and we're looking at here the patriarchs, we're looking at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the sons of Jacob. There are pieces of those stories where the astrology aspect is obvious. You just have to know where to look. And this is largely what Rav Shmuel is doing for us. He is taking us into some Kabbalistic principles, some serious analysis of the Sefer Yitzirah, of the Book of Formation. And he is telling you, go back, read your Bible stories, and see that 
we are really dealing with a world where the constellation, the time of the month, means something. That certain events could only have happened at certain times. That when we look at our lives and we look at, I'm coming in now to the month of Cheshvan, or which is which is quite a while off. Yeah, we got to get through Tishrei first, so it's eight, nine, seven, eight weeks away at least. Or I was born in this month, or I have a relationship, my husband, my wife, my child. Um, I can tell you that I fully understand myself and my daughter now, that I realigned our astrological signs according to the Hebrew calendar. Right? It is impossible that we are both Leos. Totally impossible. My kid is a Leo, 100%. Um, natural, benevolent dictator. My, my astrological sign is a Cancer. I am a, I'm a, I'm a little crab, as our friend is over here, too. Um, it works. It helps you to understand. It doesn't necessarily predict everything about me, but I can look at a lot of stuff in my life and say, yeah, this is Cancer. This is, this is the crab. This is the water sign. And without going to a, to a psychiatrist or to a therapist, I can I can make this I can make um, explanations I can have understanding of what I am how I how I naturally react to certain things and you know over a couple of the previous weeks and courses that we've done here we've talked about a lot of very complicated stuff uh, verses in the Bible that associate with the month uh, the group that we had here didn't particularly take to it but the last time I did this course which was about a year ago where we looked at the verse of the month, people were literally shocked. It's a take your breath away moment. If it works, if it works. And that's again a big part of this. There's a lot of variety, there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of factors go into what a month is all about. And some of them are going to work for you. Some of them will speak to you, and some of them will not. Uh, something you'll realize 10 years from now. The best, the best and most um, appreciated and valued letters, emails that I get are from people who say, you know, 20 years ago you taught a class and now I get it. That's like, wow. That's, that's the way this stuff works. This stuff is magical. It is totally magical. It can be incredibly dramatic and sometimes it can be painful because it can, it can touch a button that you may not want to have touched, right? But here with Rabbi Shmuel and the Shemi Shmuel, we're really looking at Bible stories. And what we looked at last time was a story that is not here, and that is Abraham and God, the Brit Ben Habitarim, the, uh, the covenant between the pieces of the sacrifices. So Abraham complains to God, I, I see in my astrological chart I can't have children. And God says, well, I'm God. I'm going to show you things from my point of view and how things are going to be in the future. So it's right in the Rashi on the, on the, in the very beginning in Genesis where we, where we meet Abraham. And God lifts Abraham up above the orbits of the planets, out of the physical world, if you wish, and says, from up here, I pull the strings on the planets. And I'm going to hand this over to you to do it, if you want it. And that is a general point where Jewish people, where spiritually attuned people, get access to the powers of the months of the year, of time itself. And we are given the ability to manipulate it for the good. Because everything has two sides to it. Along comes uh, Jacob and sons. Right? Jacob has 12 sons. And each individual tribe has its own constellation. This is not in the Sefer Yitzirah, this comes from the Zohar, from later stuff, that the tribes and the constellations line up. There's at least two ways of lining up the tribes and the constellations, but we don't need to worry about that too much. But what the sons of Jacob do, 
Um, the daughter of Jacob, I'm sorry, ladies, is out, is out of the picture in this respect. We're going to have to work very, very hard to find women's roles in guiding and leading astrology. Um, but the 12 progenitors of the tribes, the 12 men who are the sons of Jacob, each one continues on the work of Abraham, fine tunes the connection that each tribe will ultimately have with the month of the year, right? And the, the list is, is relatively straightforward. We're looking at Tishrei and Cheshvan here, the first and the second months of the year, and the tribes are, for those two months, Ephraim and Menashe. Now, if you know well, please switch, switch sides. Um, Ephraim is the second born son of Joseph, right? He is, not a son, he is not a son of Jacob, he's a grandson. Ephraim is the second born, Manasseh is the first born. And for very specific reasons, Jacob brings Ephraim forward and places him as the first born and Manasseh as the second born. So Tishrei, Cheshvan is Ephraim, Menashe, second born, first born. And we, we talked about this, this whole sort of thing. It's to do with the meaning of the names of the men themselves. And this is something we do get in a lot of the other writings on, on this subject, that it's not just the nature of the tribe, it's not just the blessings that the tribes are given by both Jacob and Moses, Jacob at the end of Genesis, Moses at the end of Deuteronomy. It is the actual names of the men who are the fathers of the tribes. So Ephraim is to be fruitful, to do good, to see blessing and happiness right away, whereas Menashe is to forget. And these are the names that Joseph gives his two sons. God calls me to forget all of my difficulties in getting to this point. That has to be according to Jacob's retooling of this whole astrological alignment of tribe and month, that the first month of the year, Tishrei, has to be do good. No matter how bad you've been in the past year, no matter how much you're still stuck in the old ways, in doing things that you don't want to do, that you know you should not be doing, just go ahead and do something good. And then the next month, which is Cheshvan, which appears to be an empty month, it only appears to be an empty month in terms of holidays and exciting stuff in it, then you have the space to sit back and say, well, I don't want to continue doing these negative things that I have been doing. And you can expand this to mitzvot, to commandments, to ethical conduct, to relationships, right? to your own personal development, and all of us have things that we, um, we can't stop doing because we like doing them or because we just can't stop doing them, right? Whatever it happens to be, right? Um, the issue of the scorpion is, again, the, the Sefer Yitzhak, the book of formation, the book of creation. The scorpion, we are told, it does everything with coldness. And the scorpion is pictured as opposed to the snake. The snake will confront you and frighten you, whereas the scorpion just sits around and waits for you to come and then bites you in, in his book, does something good by killing you or hurting you very badly. The scorpion equals coldness. And the good that we can get out of the coldness and sitting around waiting, because apparently scorpions don't do very much in the course of the day, Except, uh, I have no idea what scorpions do. And I'm sure there's a National Geographic special we can all watch and um, enjoy. But, um, you know, go and look up in Wikipedia and see if this is actually true. Scorpions apparently don't do much. They sit around uh, under rocks and wait for people to come by. And I guess they also reproduce and have scorpion babies and stuff like that. And they must eat. But they are cold-blooded creatures who act with coldness towards other creatures. So the point of coldness in this particular month, the month of Cheshvan, which seems to be absent of mitzvot, absent of holidays, is you've got a habit that you don't like. 
you've got something that you want to cut out of your relationship, which you know is harming the connection with someone you love, someone you really care about. You've got um, an Avera, you've got a sin that you do. Right? We're in a religious environment, we can, uh, we can talk about this sort of thing. You've got a sin, you've got a something, that, something that you do that you know is really wrong. Apply to it coldness, apply to it boredom. I've done this so many times. What have I gotten out of it? It's too much trouble to just go out and do this, whatever it happens to be. We try to stick to um, you know, relatively safe examples, non-kosher food. Not so easy to find non-kosher food in Jerusalem. It's too much trouble to go out in the heat to go find a cheeseburger or a restaurant that will serve me a cheeseburger on Shabbat, right? Um, I'm sure there is one somewhere. But this is the sort of aspect, and this is the way of looking at things, and this is Jacob, our father, fine-tuning the whole alignment of the tribes, the names of the tribes, the uh, constellations and what they represent. Right? The scorpion isn't up there in the sky. There's no scorpion in the, uh, in, the, in the constellation of Scorpio. The other thing that goes with this is, of course, again, looking at the Sefer Yitzhak, that's the very first piece that I, that I reproduced for you, intestines. Um, you know, stuff that goes on in your intestine is sort of yucky and you don't want to think about it. Um, but the classic picture of what the intestine is about, and this is something we didn't get into last time, um, the intestine also is coldness. And we're, I'm, I'm quoting you by heart from the, uh, from the Shem Bishma. I don't think I put this in the translation at all, that the intestines are white and contain no blood, therefore they must be a cold and heartless part of the body. Take it or leave it in terms of the, the reality. I mean, there, there are, there's blood, there's muscles, there's all sorts of things in this. But the classical view that he is taking on is saying the scorpion and the intestine represent coldness and a non-attachment to what is going through them. Right? And we're, we'll see as we go through one of the other months also has a different part of the intestine or a different word for intestine in it as well. And the process is very, very obviously, very simply, your gastrointestinal tract takes in food which contains good stuff and not so good, so good stuff, expels the bad, keeps the good. Right? Simplest, most crude um, ex explanation of what what your innards do, All right? You eat your lunch, some of it just goes out and some of it is re retained and is put to good use inside you. So again, this is the, the Tishrei Cheshvan um, combination. Month number one, month number two, start off doing good. Month number two, do, do your best to, to not get too excited about all the negative things and the things that you really do know are failings in, our, in your life. I mean, there are things that we do that we don't recognize as being bad, and you need someone to point it out to you. But I think most of the time we, we do know what we're doing wrong, and we do know where we're going wrong. Okay? So that's pretty much what we were talking about last week, or la the last day, which was um, yesterday. I want to take us into page number one on the, uh, on the English handout. And about halfway down, I've got the key lines from the division of the kingdom. We're here with um, Shmuel of Sachachav, and he is focusing quite a bit of time on the events immediately following the division of the kingdom after the death of King Solomon. All right, so if you have a Bible in front of you, uh, it is the Melachim Aleph, the first book of Kings, chapter 12. Right? And I put a few of the important verses here. I want to take a little bit of time and just take a look at this because I think this is, this is Reb Shmuel, this is the Shemi Shmuel at his very, very best. And he's telling you that this is a story of the month of Cheshvan. That what goes on here in first book of Kings chapter 12 is something that happened in the what, what the text here calls the eighth month 
It's month number eight. But it is not, in fact, by our calculation, number eight. It's the second month of the year, starting with Tishri. Okay, some of you folks are cold. All right. Ah. It's not actually a pleasant noise when you, when you realize it. Hmm? I see two, and that's about, and that's about it. Yeah, it looks like there's one right at the top there. So we're in the early days of the nation of Israel living in its land. And we've gone through three kings where the entire nation is united to some degree. If you do read the, uh, the previous chapters, you see, of course, it isn't all uh, a wonderful time. There's plenty of dissent. We have King Saul. We have David. right? And the, these two did not get along. They were not father and son. Uh, they were not very happy with each other. Uh, Saul tried to kill David on numerous occasions. But um, interesting, interesting stories. And they do, they do read as very dramatic stories as well. Uh, then comes King Solomon, builds the temple, builds palaces, builds up the city, city of Jerusalem. And we come now to a point where King Solomon has died and he has a son. Rehoboam, Rechavam. So the two characters are Rechavam and Yaravam. Uh, Rechav is obviously to spread, to be spread about, or to spread out, to be wide. Am is the people. Yaravam, Yudresh Bet, is to argue or to fight. Am, the people. Uh, so the, the names are often quite significant, but that's re not really what we're focusing on. Rechav Am, in verse number one, is the son of King Solomon, and he is first in line to the throne. He's the Prince of Wales, and he's ready to ascend the throne. So he goes to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. This particular place, he's going to be enthroned. And it was when Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, heard of this, when he was yet in Egypt, we had fled from King Solomon, and Jeroboam had settled in Egypt. What happened to Jeroboam? Homework, folks. If you feel the urge and the interest in um, figuring out who Yarav Am was and why he was in Egypt and why he fled before King Solomon, he's obviously not um, someone who appeared out of nowhere. He's, a, he's a, an important political figure. Maybe he's related. So wh what's going on there? But he hears this news and he says, I'm back. It's now my time. They sent and called him, verse number three, and Jeroboam and all the, all the people, all the nation of Israel, and spoke to Rechav Am, saying, I don't think anybody calls their kid Rechav Am today, um, either in English or in Hebrew. Right? So Rechav Am is there, and they've got a really big complaint. Your father made our yoke difficult. Now lighten your father's hard work and his heavy yoke, which he placed upon us, and we shall serve you. Right? King Solomon great king, enormous splendor. The nation of Israel has tremendous prestige in the world at that time. But it came at a price. Taxes, right? And taxes in those days often included, and this is the Torah tells us here, um, that the tax was physical labor. You had to give one month a year as, as, a, as a laborer. And when they were built, it's the description of building, building Solomon's temple, that they had laborers who were conscripted laborers and had to work in the forests, cutting the, cutting the cedar trees, and then had to work in the temple and the palaces themselves. And then, of course, there's the upkeep, right? You don't have a palace without servants, right? And an awful lot of servants, right? They didn't have all the machinery that we have today for cooking and cleaning and that sort of stuff. It was all done by hand. And then obviously they had fishermen and farmers under contract as well. And that they didn't get paid for. That was, that was your 
extra tithe. That was the price of having all of this. And they couldn't say this to King Solomon, but to the son, they could. It's too much. We can't take it. So verse number five, he said to them, go away for three days, then return. The people left. And King Rehavam took counsel with the elders who attended Solomon, his father, while he was yet alive. And he said, what counsel do you give me to reply to this people? Well, at least he sought some advice. He didn't listen to it. The elders, Solomon's um, courtiers and advisors said, if you will be a servant to this people today, and you will minister to them, the avadatam, you will serve them. The word is not minister in the Hebrew. The anitam, and you will respond to them, and you will say nice things to them. Then they will be your servants for all times. How to deal with people, right? Classic lesson. But he disregarded the counsel of the elders who advised him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and who were attending him. And he said to them, what do you advise, etc., etc." And the young men that had grown up with him spoke to him saying, so shall you say to this people, your father has made our yoke heavy and you make it lighter for us, thus shall you speak to them. Say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Doesn't sound like a nice response, but um, my little finger is thicker and more muscular than the thighs of my father. I'm bigger and tougher than the old man ever was. Don't mess with me. All right, here's the verse. Here's the, the, one of the key verses here. And this is what Rabbi Shmuel is showing us. This is a series of events that happened in the eighth month and that connects with the things of the eighth month, which we are, of course, referring to as the second month of the year in Cheshvan. My father burdened you with a heavy yoke. I shall add to your yoke. My father flogged you with whips, but I will flog you with scorpions. Wonderful thing to say to people. Mm -hmm. Um, Rashi says it's a goad or a sting because they sting like a scorpion, right? So in sort of real terms, this is some sort of whip that had barbs on it. I will whip you with barbed wire. Um, whereas my father was nice to you and he just whipped you with a regular whip. It's imagery, but the scorpion is the important one. And here we are in the month of the scorpion with this series of events taking place. Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehavam on the third day and they said, the king replied to the people harshly, disregarded the counsel of the elders. And he spoke to them as the counsel of the young men, my father made your yoke heavy. I will add to your yoke. My father flogged you with whips. I shall flog you with scorpions yet again. The king didn't listen to the people for it was something brought about by God in order to fulfill his word that God had spoken through the prophet Achiah to Jeroboam, the son of Nevat. Right, so you gotta go home and read up the backstory of who y Yarav Am is and why he had to leave to Egypt and why he's coming back now. All of Israel, verse number 16, key verse that we're, we're gonna pick up on here. All of Israel saw that the king had not listened to them and they said to the king, what share do we have in David? And we have no heritage in the son of Yishai. To your homes, O Israel, now see your house, David. Re'eh ve'techa David. Look at your house. Um, sarcastically nasty saying to King David, who's of course not there, you made this house, you made this dynasty of kings, the house being dynasty, look at it. And, or else the temple. Rashi says the house refers to the temple, so it, fit, it fits both. The house of King David being the dynasty and the house of God that was built by David's son Solomon being, being the temple. The scorpion, is taken to be made up of two words, right? Your Hebrew is wonderful at this point, right? You at least know the alphabet, folks, right? 
How do you spell scorpion in Hebrew? Ayin, kuf, resh, bet, akrav. The word of the day is scorpion. Ayin, kuf, resh, bet. If you separate this out into two words, you have ayin, kuf, resh, akar, to uproot, to pull out a plant by the roots. Akar, bet, buy it, house. In the month of the scorpion, where they are mocked by their king, I'm going to whip you with scorpions. They come back and say, you do this to us, we are going to uproot the house. Your house, your dynasty, and your temple. And this could only be in the month of the scorpion. Right? So this stuff makes an awful lot of sense in terms of the story aspect, if you're open to this being a layer that comes through in certain places. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the whole point of this astrology stuff, right? I'm not gonna call it astrology the science, astrology the art, it's stuff. There are forces that we don't fully understand. When God made time and space and things and places, the times were given a certain amount of power and force, not to do things by themselves. The power of the scorpion is not to independently come and control the people and turn us into scorpions who sting others or anything like that. The, the scorpion power of the month is something called coldness and rejection and boredom and lack of heat and enthusiasm that we have a choice to either be above it metaphorically and pull its strings and say here's something I can do with boredom and coldness or just float along go with the flow of the time and say hmm I'll have a quiet month. We had all those holidays in the month of Tishrei. Let's, um, let's not bother with anything for, for a few weeks here. Right? So this is like a straightforward and simple application of it. You can take this and then say, well, there's stuff in my life that I can do like this. I'll set aside the month of Tishrei for doing good. Mm -hmm. Looking to make happy and good connections. I can say I'll set aside the month of Cheshvan for saying, well, I did all those good things and look how much I benefited from it. Look how happy my husband is now, right? Look how happy my kids are. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, look how much blessing I see in my life. And Cheshvan, well, there's still some stuff I need to clean out here. My mind is not as pure and as good as it should be. But I'm going to do that by not beating myself up, but by letting it wither by just getting bored with eating those cheeseburgers every day, right? Whatever, whatever it happens to be. All right, so there's, there's more, there's more, there's more. And we're going to zip a little bit ahead. Um, obviously, the kingdom of the north begins here, that the ten northern tribes form their own, their own. Ephraim is the tribe. It is the northern tribes, it is the children of Joseph who take the lead, and this is something we're going to see. As opposed to the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, who are under the control still of the house of David, of King Solomon, and the tribe of Judah. Right? Um, so there's obvious problems if we just keep reading on here. You can read a lot of this for, you, for yourselves. Um, Yarav Ya Am is in a very difficult situation. Holidays are coming. People go to Jerusalem for the holidays, right? There was a temple. These are pilgrimage festivals where people literally went to Jerusalem. And there are all sorts of issues regarding the status of the king of the north, who was not a king of the house of David. And he would have had to go on the pilgrimage with the ordinary people and just be there with the ordinary people, whereas the king was there in an exalted and high position, right? the king that they had rejected. 
And also he wanted to keep his people home. He didn't want to let them see all the nice things in the temple, all the wonderful good stuff in Jerusalem. So he made a couple of idolatrous temples, appointed himself a priest, appointed idolatrous priests as, as priests, and the lines that we need to take a great deal of attention to are the very last two lines in this whole, in this whole chapter. Uh, verse 32, Jeroboam made a festival in the eighth month, which is, of course, the second month, which is Cheshvan, on the 15th day of the month, and he brought up offerings, etc., etc. So he knew people would indeed go to Jerusalem, not for Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, but for Sukkot, right? The holiday of Sukkot is the big pilgrimage festival at Adayom Hazer, up to and including our time. And then the very last line is significant. He brought offerings on the altar which he had made on the 15th day of the eighth month, in the month that he had fabricated from his heart, right? The line here in the month, in the Chodesh, that he had invented and created from his own heart is superfluous in the text. You look at the English for a couple of seconds, you'll see. He did it on, he made offerings on the altar on the 15th day of the eighth month, in the month which he had fabricated from his heart. We know he did. He didn't make, he didn't fabricate the month, he fabricated the holiday. Right? So, Reb Shmuel is going to tell us that it's not Chodesh, but Chidush, Chet Dalet Shin, renewal, making things new, and also Chodesh, the month, in the sense of the month being parallel to Israel itself, because we are like the month, meaning the moon, Right? We're, not, we're not following the solar month at all. And also the house of David. All right, Chap page number three in the handout. Ah, we're going to meet Rabbi Nachem Mendel of Rimanov here. And he's another one of the great Hasidic rabbis. And 1745 to 1815. So if you're looking in the Hebrew talk side, it's page Tet Vav, it's like the third, third reprinted page. And if you're looking at the English, it should be about the second paragraph from the top. Okay. Ketiv bi Yeravam, it is written about Jeroboam. That he made a festival b'mar cheshvan, in this month of cheshvan. Right? It's not called Cheshvan, the Hebrew, the months get their names much later, after the exile in Babylon. It's only into the later prophets, Zechariah, Haggai, Malachi, Daniel, that we have names for the month. They're Babylonian names, they're not intrinsically Hebrew. Nonetheless, we adopt them. And we, we do find significant meaning. If you stick with this program, we're going to see that the names of the months even though they're not originally Hebrew, do have meaning in the Hebrew language. They came from a, they came from a related language anyway. Bachodesh Asher Bada Milibo in the month which he invented, created from his own heart. Now, we're going to expand the concept of month, and month is in Hebrew Chodesh from chadash, meaning new, and also renewal. It is well known that Malchut Yisrael, the kingship of Israel, the kings, the dynasty, the descendants of King David, and the rest of us as well, the entire Jewish nation, is exactly like the month which renews itself every single month. Right, the moon waxes and wanes, so too do the kings, so too do the ordinary people of Israel. We have our ups and downs. The nation has its ups and downs. If you look in biblical history, if you look over the entire history of the Jewish people, we've had times when we were really, really down, and we've had times when we were pretty darn powerful, right? And just like the moon is called Chodesh because of Hit Chad Shut, Right? Here's where your Hebrew helps. Uh, right? Chet Dalet Shin is to be new. 
you buy a new shirt, it is a something, it is chadash, right? Hitchad shirt is self-renewal. The moon renews itself. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Similarly, the kingdom of Israel or the kings of Israel continually renew themselves with new longing for connection to God. And every day, Chaviva Alehem Rishona. He's talking about, he's switching back and forward without actually switching back and forward between the macro and the micro. One of the great things about Hasidut, about the writings of the Hasidic rabbis, is they, they often tend to be talking about the whole nation of Israel, the entire population of the world, and the individual person at the same time. Right? So this is like pretty dramatic stuff. And a lot of the time they're analyzing and they're telling you things that you, you didn't realize was there in the Bible story, but it's always talking about you. It always comes down to you as the believing, thinking human being. Behold Yom, every single day, our relationship with God is just like the very first time we ever met God. Right? However, we want, we want to put that into, into our own lives. And the kingdom of David, the kingship of David, here's, it's a very fine analogy he's going to make here. He be'er mayim chayim. It is a well of living water that always flows. This was King David. He's going to make a distinction that is really quite fine here, but it is quite significant. What's the difference between the nation of Israel, of Judah in the south, which is ruled over by King David, and the nation of Israel in the north, which is ruled over by a descendant of Joseph, or is represented by Joseph. He's going to say, tell you exactly what the difference is. Um, we are into a little bit of graphic X-rated terminology. We're, we're all adults here, right? Good. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube and you're under 18 years old, um, please, Call your mom and dad in, right? Um, we, don't, we don't want to get in trouble, right? Seriously, that's not a joke. This was David. King David was continually longing for God with love, and she wrote v'tishbachot, and he was writing songs and praises to God. And in one of the, the lesser-known books of, of the Zohar, we are told that King David is every single day still, up to, including today, singing songs and praises of God that no ear has yet heard. King David is a well, is a well of fresh water, is a well that has a source that feeds it, but you've got to drop a bucket into the well to get the water out. You've got to go to the well and you've got to want to drink the water from it. And when the kingship was taken, and given over from the seed, from the children of King David, and it was given to the children of Joseph, then we get into a different picture altogether. What is Joseph famous for in this type of discussion and terminology? Joseph is the Yisod. I'm going to say the word penis. I'm sorry, ladies. Um, but it is different from a well. It is a shuba madrigat chai. I'm going to skip over some of the more complicated terminology. This is a well of living water. Right? He's putting it in, in a bit more cleaner terminology as well. King David and his kingdom, the southern kingdom, are a well, whereas Joseph and the northern kingdom are a fountain. A fountain of water and of life. He's quoting the Sha'arei Ora of Rabbi Yosef ibn Jikatiya, a very, very early um, Kabbalistic source of Zohar before the Zohar was even known. So David and the southern kingdom are a well. Joseph and the northern kingdom are a spring and a fountain. The spring and the fountain renew themselves every day, every moment. You look at a spring, you look at a spring of water, and you see the water gushing out or trickling out, whatever it does. You look at a well, you don't see the flow. You only notice it that you keep taking water out of it, there's still water left in it. 
It's a different attitude, it's a different way of looking at things. And if Yaravam, if Jeroboam and the northern kingdom had stuck with God and not done their idolatrous altars, they built calves, you actually go and see them. Um, Tell Dan up north is really, really worth a visit. You actually see the altars with which Jeroboam built. Then things would be fine. And you've got to look at Midrash, you've got to look at the commentaries that go into the next chapter or so um, of, this, of the book of Kings, where we're looking at Kings 1, 12, 13 or so. God has the conversation with Jeroboam and says, stick with me. Everything will be fine. It'll be good. I want this. This is part of God's plan. Right? Nonetheless, what Jeroboam did was kill Kale Midat Hitchad Shutchebo. He damaged, he destroyed the factor of renewal that was intrinsic to his tribe's origin. The northern kingdom is Joseph. It is a fountain, a spring, a source of life, a source of new life and renewal. But he made hitchad shut ra'a. He made a bad new thing. Zehachodesh asher badam libo, and that is what the verse means at the very end of First Kings chapter twelve. The month, the chodesh, the renewal, rather than the month, which he created from his own heart. He should have done things according to God's plans and God's instructions, which God explicitly says to him, certainly in Midrash, also in prophecy as well. Um, stick with me, do mitzvahs, be good, and we can, we can work something out here. Nonetheless, he said, no, I want an idolatrous temple. I want to be the center and focus of, of it all. And he started up his own religion or his own variation of Judaism. And that is a particularly bad thing. And this Rabbi Shmuel is showing us, and he's got a whole analysis of where he gets it from that I've, that I've actually left out in the translation. And if you feel the urge, we can, we can actually look this up. Um, and we can read it, but it's the next seven or eight lines that are here that I, that I haven't translated for you. That this is our story too. And this is the story that is available for us in the month of Cheshvan. Be swept up in the events. Go with the new and the exciting. Or use the power of new and renewal and newness and freshness to do something good following the old ways and old paths that have been taught to us from the very beginning. So what we can say here, and again, I'm, I'm just skipping about eight lines in the Hebrew, that the sin of Jeroboam was, he killed Kael midat ha-hitchadshut. The factor, the power of newness and renewal, the spring, the ever-flowing spring of water of life, he ruined this. What was the effect? The effect was very, very significant. What happened then is the nations of the world were able to come and take this power of renewal from us. He's explaining absolutely everything that ever happened in the world, which is, which is the amazing thing because when you sit back and you look at it and you say, yeah, this does make sense. He is explaining everything. He's not just being dramatic or trying to say, I know everything, because, but he really does have access to, to the information that explains an awful lot of stuff in this world. The nations of the world, we're not necessarily talking about just other countries like Switzerland and Norway and whatever. We're talking about the things that are represented by these nations because there are entities of the spiritual nature up there in heaven that represent these nations as well as the physical nations that surround us. So here we go. The nations of the world took this power of hitchadshut, this power of renewal, this creative power, right? Let's call it creation. They took it away from Israel. And they caused us to be exiled from our land. 
because the power of renewal, because the power that was offered on a plate to the nation of Joseph, led by Jeroboam, he threw it away. He did something negative with it. The nations of the world were then able to come and take it. There are other nations in the world. There are other people in the world. And they do their best to feed off the spiritual energy that comes down into the world through the Jewish people, through the kings, through the spiritual leaders of the Jews. So once we don't do the right thing, and when we actually go and do the wrong thing with this energy, then it becomes available for everyone else to take. And they can do it and use it, and they use it against us. They use the power to overpower us, exile us from our land, because what ultimately happens, the 10 northern, king, 10 northern tribes disappear. They're exiled. And eventually, the, uh, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin too. The Tamid Heim goes Jumalinu Gzeirot Raot, and even more. The nations of the world make and create very bad decrees against us that are totally new. Right? Look at the, the broad brush strokes of history. Where on earth do the nations of the world get the ideas that they use to beat us up with? They get it, according to this, from the perversion of the power of doing new things, of Hitchad Shut, that was given to Yaravam, to Jeroboam, to the ten northern tribes, which are the tribes and the character of, the tri of, the, of Joseph. And they didn't want them. They didn't want them for God's schedule and list of, of, of purposes. But they then did what they wanted for their own glory, for their own power, for Jeroboam's greatness and establishment as a king. And then the nations of the world were able to grab onto this power, and they used it against us. They used it against us by making up all sorts of accusations, by creating all sorts of uh, mechanisms for squeezing our very blood out of us. And this is what Rabbi Nachem Mendel of Rimenov says. It's a very, very well-known quote. That all the bad decrees that are created against the Jewish people, may heaven preserve us from these things, all the taxes, all the arnona, that's the arnona, property taxes, that suck the blood of Israel, they all begin in the month of Cheshvan. Right? Cheshvan is, of course... This time of year coming up, it's going to be October, November. That's when your Arnona, your property taxes, are increased. Which is, of course, not what we're talking about. But we're talking about historically, Jews were subject to extra taxation and incredible burdens of taxation because the nations, the local leaders kings, princes, bishops, whatever it may be, had a need for money. Oh, the Jews have money. We'll just simply take it. We'll issue a decree that every Jew has to pay X amount of gold, whatever it is. Each Jewish family has to provide whatever it is for the, for the royal coffers. These come, at, if not in the month of Cheshvan, at least from the power of the month of Cheshvan that is given over to them. And now we understand. I hope you understand, he says, that since with the month of Cheshvan, it is said, the renewal, the newness that he brought out from his own heart, Jeroboam, and through our continued sins, this Hitchad Shut, this power of renewal, of making new things, this power of creation, this creative generating energy is given over to them, it's given over to the dark side, it's given over to the nations of the world who use it for their own negative purposes and for their own enrichment at our expense. Nonetheless, there's a tikkun, right? You're familiar with the word tikkun. A tikkun is not the way it's generally used uh, to say just setting things right and fixing things, but a tikkun is an operation that you do here on earth that has an effect in the spiritual realms 
as well as in the physical realms. So we have this whole thing that was started by Jeroboam, where he perverted and overturned and gave over this particular power of the month of Cheshvan to the nations of the world to use against us. How can we fix this? Through Hitchad Shut Shebi Yisrael, that the month of Cheshvan is a time of renewal and creation in the nation of Israel. How do we do this? That the month of Cheshvan is a very appropriate time to make fixed times for learning Torah and for teaching Torah, those of us who have the ability to actually teach. Ish ish, every single person, chabura v'chabura, through groups, uh, each group of people, wherever they may live, this hitchadshut, this renewal, this invention, this starting of Torah classes and lessons is what will ultimately take the power of renewal from the nations of the world and bring it back to us where it really belongs. Amen, King Yehirat. So may it be thy will, he says. Right? So we, we've, we've learned quite a bit. This is, this is a deep one. This is a tough one. And it's not entirely simple to understand, but it is very, very solidly based in a pretty straightforward Bible story. You have this gentleman called Yaravam, whoever he was and why ever he was exiled for whatever reason. He comes back. He takes over. He brings the the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Joseph to power uh, over the kingdom of David in faith, instead of uh, a fountain as opposed to a well. The power of gushing forth the water of life. And once he takes that power and uses it, as that last verse says, for stuff that he invents himself, not for mitzvot, not for Torah-based purposes, then it's a free-for-all. Then we Jews are saying, okay, we don't want it anymore. And the nations of the world were able to grab it and use it, and they used it against us. And the tikkun that Rabbi Shmuel tells us to use is add Torah classes. Start learning completely new stuff. Anytime. But particularly the month of Cheshvan, where this power of the tribe of Joseph is evident and foremost, we can grab onto it and it not just works better, but it affects a tikkun, it makes up and fixes and repairs that which was done in the past. Now you understand absolutely everything, right? <laughs> I, th I think I do anyway. Uh, if anyone ever tells you this, um, you know they don't know nothing. Um, interesting stuff. Cheshvan next month is Kislev. Right, so next time um, we will look at Kislev and Hanukkah and Tevet and uh, well, we'll move on through the, through, the, through the 12 months of the year.